in order to get anything to happen, you have to take a certain amount of risk and you have to sort of go into an area where you're not sure you're going to be able to pull it off. George is always known as an innovator. Uh, here we go again. He's doing something new. He's doing something different. It certainly is a, it's a, risk, it's a risky idea. The quality of an image that's captured on a digital camera does not stand up against the same image that would be captured on a piece of motion picture film. When you're shooting a film, it's like doing beautiful art, you know, traditional art. Uh, video today is still modern art, not even good modern art yet. There is a lot of controversy about the fact that we're shooting this digitally. As far as I'm concerned, they should have been shooting digital cinema 20 years ago. People say, why am I doing it? Say, you know, the real question is, why not? Well, the very first time that George ever discussed his concept of a digital future for, uh, for the cinema and television was in 1989. And I'm even amazed now how precise that vision actually was about what he wanted to achieve. First of all, there was a series, Young Indiana Jones. He wanted to make that a test bed for digital effects. On the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, which was shot in 16 mil, by the way, George was already tampering with digital editions, digital extensions, and replication. That series was really the test of digital technology. George wanted to fold the technology that we had developed on Young Indy and try and do the same thing in a feature film called Radioland Murders. He was curious to see if it was possible to do the same thing on 35mm and project it onto a big screen. No one had a problem in terms of the effects. In fact, they're imperceptible. Even though the film wasn't successful, that part of the process was incredibly successful for us. So George had the confidence to use that same technology in The Phantom Menace. Stand up. let's go. And then we've gone one stage further in episode two, actually shooting on digital. For the kind of films that George makes, the kind of films that we make, we are ostensibly in the digital arena from the first day that we actually start working. Uh, most people fail to realize this, but basically what happens is every single frame, every single shot in the movie has a digital effect. Pretty much every set has blue screen, even if it's just out a window or something. It's everywhere. Uh, I think I've been on one set where there hasn't been any blue screen. So for us to shoot and film and then scan it into a computer is a ridiculous process. Right now, we can shoot on high def, and 50 minutes after we shoot a 50-minute cassette, it's inside the computer. Well, yes, this is uh, the day shooting. There's no more laboratory. It's now on tape. Uh, sound and picture on the same recording device, sunk automatically for us to uh, put in on the computers. It's all on this one thing. Watch the camera! Watch the camera! Watch the camera! Watch the camera! We wanted to shoot the last film this way and uh, had been working with Sony for several years to try to make it happen um, and just couldn't get the cameras built fast enough. There were certain inherent basic issues. Video is shot at 30 frames per second, film is shot at 24 frames per second, and that was a major holdback for us. The biggest difference with these cameras is that they were developed to provide a 24 frame per second frame rate, which is exactly the, the rate that we've been using for production photography and film. So it means that when they scan it onto film, you have one video frame to every film frame. The next big problem that we had was, of course, not just the camera, but the lenses. The lenses that come with the camera were not acceptable to acquire this widescreen format that we shoot. So the only place I could go to then was Panavision. Yeah, the computer design lenses, um, focusing on a very small target. The actual chips that are in the camera are smaller than a 35 millimeter film image. That meant the performance of the lens actually had to be better than a 35 millimeter lens since you were using a, a smaller area to image the entire high resolution frame on. The depth of field, the clarity, the sharpness of the image, the brightness uh, was something that still just knocked us mm -hmm. off our feet. There's never any doubt about no, whether or not so you, you can see something, something in the background or you will see something in the background. It's exactly how it's going to be on the big screen. The cameraman, uh, the prop department, wardrobe, hair, myself, everybody gets to see the dailies, everybody gets to see if anything's wrong, and they get to fix it by the next take, whereas normally you wait until the next day and then you have to go back and reshoot it. Go 
the mobility of the film camera is still better than digital. I could move the Nariflex, move all of the work, go all over the mountains with any temperature and shoot. We spent years in the uh, film industry trying to get the camera free. Now suddenly we're tied to cables again. On this show we, uh, we've got to plug seven cables into the camera. An HD, a time code, a gen lock, two audios and data. The camera, to be honest, does feel a bit cumbersome. It's pretty long, it's unwieldy. But already, you know, even since we started, they've made a new, new zoom lens. It's half the size, half the weight. And next year, the camera's going to be half the size. I am sure it will improve eventually. It's, it's, digital is work in progress. Breathing down the neck of the, uh, of the film camera. It doesn't mean that technology is going to make the film any better. That has nothing to do with art. Technology is used to tell a story, and that's the whole point. It's really the, the, the filmmaker and the storyteller and how well they're able to tell the story that counts in the end. The, the techniques they use are really a, a byproduct of that. Thanks, folks. First up in the morning, the other pot will come in. We'll take the gray pot out tonight. Jeds. And we'll start with scene five. Can we get the charts yeah. for it? So that's a wrap. I'm a visual filmmaker as opposed to a literary filmmaker, so it, the movie doesn't rest in the dialogue, it rests in the visuals. In episode one, we had established a very Art Nouveau, very fluid form, and episode four had a very, sort of very um, industrial, engineered, angular shape, and so now we're kind of bridging that gap, so we're mixing a little bit of yeah, both. We're shooting back Ultimately, the overriding factor on Obi-Wan's ship and all of the Jedi ship is that I wanted them to be reminiscent of the design of the Star Destroyers and the Imperial ships, because ultimately that's where those ships grew out of. I think we can begin to introduce the, the wedge shippy. When he the saw the design, started to incorporate um, his um, new storyline to it. And so the whole idea of taking that shape and turning it into a Jedi fighter evolved with the design process. Yeah. Maybe take some World War I battleships, German, cut them off about hmm. halfway through, you know, take them top and bottom and <laughs> wedge them out a little bit. Okay, and then it's my job and the rest of the artists to come up with the background for that design and make it make sense so that no one questions the design when they see the film. Boom down and then... Obi-Wan's Jedi fighter is actually one of the very first ships now that we're starting to see sort of uh, tying the aesthetic design that we've established in episode one with the pre-existing designs of episode four. A tighter version. We're so familiar with um, that triangular shape as being the symbol or the icon for the Empire that to take that and actually uh, give it a new personality, a new identity, which is the, the spaceship in the shape for the Jedi Starfleet, was actually a really brilliant move and actually made the whole symbolism very powerful because you can slowly see how everything slowly starts turning towards the dark side. And even this could have a little bit of a... George has the designs in his mind, and, and he sort of is the master editor of all of this. So he decides what is within the realm of the Star Wars universe and what is beyond it. For every design that I use in the movie, there's at least 10 or 15 designs that get re rejected. That hair's gonna be dry. I think mate. that's a big no, isn't it? I mean, none of it feels great to do. It always feels good to see, you know? Sort of come down as he starts to climb into it. Yeah, yeah. Obi-Wan Spider actually evolved out of about a dozen sketches. My feeling is that these are like Jedi here. The only um, designs that are turned into a model are the ones that George finally gives the, his stamp of approval that this is the design. We'll do a real quick mock-up, whether it's a small little prototype or a little foam core study model. It's to carry the design to the next stage so George can actually pick it up and hold it and look at it. And from there, he will usually have more suggestions to improve the design. The real problem was reducing it down to be a fighter, to be a really, you know, instead of being this huge, gigantic monster ship, be a little tiny, tiny ship. And I think one of the biggest issues was scale. How big do we make it or how small do we make it? Too small. 
<laughs> George will typically pick up a pencil or a pen and go and add his modifications to the designs or say, let's take you know, the cockpit of this drawing here and put it onto here. When I initially designed the ship into a single fighter, uh, there was really not any logical place to put a R2 unit. So this is the little R2 unit. He okay. actually can fit in there with a little bit of cheating. Okay. Uh, but he can't get in from the bottom, so is it okay if he drops in from yeah, the top? Yeah, drop it from the top. And will we see him do that or? No. Okay, no. he'll just be there. Just a detail. Can he make his head go around so fast that it spins off? R4 is really an R2 painted red, isn't it? Careful what you're saying about R4 because you can get bopped on the head real quick. Ooh. 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 Actually, we could have got the angle just right. And done it. I've always wanted to have my own ship, and he gets one, and he gets to take off in it on his own adventure in this one, which is cool. In action. I mean, you're sitting in a, in a wooden ship being rocked around by guys in the car. So um, to see it, I, I'm sure, because I haven't seen it yet, will be extraordinary. Cut. OK, that was good. I loved it. That was, that was beautiful. That was magnificent. Sorry, Tony Sal. What you do is you go where the story takes you. I mean, you really sort of, sometimes you have to be on location because it just demands it. When I did Star Wars, I had to come up with environments. You know, if you think of outer space and you think of other planets, they're all basically deserts. So that was a natural. To be able to go, you know, 25 years ago in the middle of the desert and take this English crew and the movement of that was bold and um, it was also foolhardy and it worked. I thought we were crazy. Yeah. I thought you were crazy. Well, everybody did. Yeah. But that's all right. I'm happy now. <laughs> The most difficult and challenging location was in uh, Norway, Finsk, the Hoth ice planet. We ran into, uh, you know, blizzards and uh, whiteouts and all kinds of things that slowed down the production, stopped it for days on end. You know, we didn't go to Norway to go skiing, and you know, we didn't go to the desert to get a suntan, and you know, it's like basically uh, you're trying to get the work done. That was a different era in filmmaking history then. In those days, virtually everything had to be built physically, whereas we have uh, much more flexibility now in the digital arena. We're getting closer and closer to where we have to shoot less and less on location. When we were doing episode two, we were going to Italy for less than a week. We were going to Spain for less than a week, Tunisia just over a week, England just over a week. It becomes a really interesting challenge in terms of the movement of people, the feeding of them, uh, making sure that they're taken care of. We are arriving to Travagiare. Ah! Ciao, ragazzi. Most filmmakers would rather be able to focus on the work at hand and not have to deal with how do you get there and what the elements are like when you're there. And it's 10 o'clock and I just want to shoot and get started. <laughs> I don't like getting my first shot off this late. No. Nope. I was scouting locations uh, as I was on my vacation and I knew I had a scene that took place in some villa someplace in a beautiful part of the countryside that was extremely romantic. I had the exact location, but I didn't have the exact scene. <laughs> I saw a picture of Lake Como, one of the locations in Italy. It's just almost surrealistic. It looks like it belongs in Star Wars. And before this, I've never been outside of North America, so it's, it's my way of seeing the world a little bit right now, too. I think the thing I enjoy about the locations in general is, is just the feeling that you're not in control, you know, that anything can happen. The case with the rain is you look at George, he looks at you, we're in a digital environment, you have such control over every single frame. We looked at each other and said, hey. It's God's way of describing the scene. It could be worse, it could be snowing. Tomorrow we go to Tunisia. Just think, 24 years ago, I vowed never to return to this awful planet. <laughs> and here I am, doing it again. We seem to be made to suffer. It's our lot in life.
I know a few of the actors that would rather not be out here. <laughs> it hasn't changed too much. It's our little funky set. All the little set pieces have been rebuilt, but uh, these are the original uh, little you know, earthen craters that uh, were there before. It's going back to the homestead, obviously. It's like going back to where you grew up. You know, it's a little weird, and it's a little nostalgic, and, you know, it's, it's, there's a certain amount of emotion that goes with uh, being back at a place you were, you know, 25 years before. Beautiful. I'm getting spine tingles. I bet. You know, the most telling moment this morning was when I saw one of the moisture evaporators. A little reunion. Yeah, the evaporators kept falling over in the middle of a take, which was kind of embarrassing. Then in the middle of a take, you know, bits of my costume would fall off. The jar was would start crying. All right, let's try one more a little bit faster. Almost any location I've shot on, I've been able to get material that I just couldn't get uh, in a studio or uh, it would take a very long time to recreate digitally. The more real things you can get in your image, the more believable those images are, and you just have to sort of tweak them for, sort of on set or in post-production. All the environments uh, that we're shooting, uh, I've always intended to digitally change so they don't look quite as they are in real life. Technologically, we're in areas that most people won't get to for another three or four or five years, and we're always on the bleeding edge of it. With digital technology the way it is, we can recreate uh, a lot of the vastness and the big parts of the location uh, digitally. And action. So George, why are you shooting a shot for episode three? I can't tell you that. <laughs> you have to wait six years for that answer. Six years. How much stuff are you doing for episode three now? Just this one shot. It's because it means that now I don't have to come back here. So it's a long way to come and bring a crew of 60 people just to shoot one shot and then rebuild the set and all the other stuff we have to do in three years. What happens if you decide you want another shot? I don't get it. <laughs> I think I'm still the little boy that you first met. And the truth is, I've changed. I'm grown up. Whenever you're casting, first of all, you're always looking for a really good actor, somebody that really has a lot of craft and is really very talented. Action! Who fits the part that you've created. For the role of Anakin, we um, had a formal screen test. 102, take one, Mark. And to be honest, I went in with no expectations. I really wasn't thinking that, you know, ooh, I really want this part. It was just, wow, you know, that's George Lucas. This is cool. Oh! And in this particular case, I was looking for somebody who was very boyish and young, but had sort of a James Dean sullen edge to him. Annie. Anakin. Annie makes me sound like a little boy. You look at those eyes and there's just so much happening there. Hayden had all the elements of the character. Don't try to grow up too fast. I am grown up. About a week after my test, not even, I was lying in bed and got the phone call that I got the part. I never would have expected to be here right now. This is Star Wars, it's really, really cool. This is my first action. Hayden's uh, stepping into a huge part to play Anakin and to be the young Darth Vader, you know? Yeah, they're liking me today. I was always the youngest ones and um, I'm now not, so. <laughs> so uh... <laughs> it's funny, the first day I, I had to take my lightsaber out and set. I didn't even realize what I was doing. And I, the first take I did, I was like, wow, wow. I was like, oh, no, you guys, you'll put that in later, won't you? I don't want to be, you know, showing him how things are because everyone has to find out for themselves. He's brilliant. I love him to death. He's a great kid. Anakin in this movie is a transitional character. He's going from the young Padawan learner to becoming aware of the fact there's more to him than that. He's always had a sense of longing for love in his life. Uh... Hayden's a wonderful actor. I'm really, really impressed by him, especially because he's very confident. 
that he's a much more complex character than the surface uh, belies. It's not really a mystery. Everyone knows that I'm going to the dark side. It's kind of like the Titanic sinking. Can you excuse me for just a moment? <laughs> Well, for me, it's it's just heaps of fun to go in and, and get dressed up as a Jedi every day and put on the boots and get to wear the cloak occasionally. Great. He's got a fantastic mind. He understands exactly the part. Every stunt he's got on this movie, he'll do it. We have a double. We have a good double. Hayden's actually too good, and I'm not really doing very much at all. I mean, he's fiercer than the double, and... You know, he's made out of tough stuff. I was heavily involved in athletics and wanted to be a hockey player, wanted to be a tennis player. <laughs> it's Star Wars, you know? Why would you not want to be a part of every aspect that you could? I don't want anyone else on the screen trying to do my thing. You know? I'll take a few bruises for the team. It's the stuntman in me. As much as it is my character, it's all coming from George's head. He is the definitive uh, of how it should be played. So you have to pay attention. Well, Hayden is actually a very talented actor. He's very good, very professional, works really hard. It's extraordinary to think right. that he's so young. I don't think he realizes how good he is. I had no idea. You try to give flashes of, of, of darkness and flashes of just pure innocence just to try to bring everything together. He was able to pull that off very well, and it was a hard thing to do. Giving yourself to the Jedi means giving your whole life. <clears throat> Well, cut that. <laughs> <laughs>
every creature and every extra that you see in each movie has a name, has a personality, um, has a backstory. They are some sort of being that has actually been given a life. There's one in um, episode two. His name is Kit Fisto. Just an extra, a guy, but all of a sudden, like, put in his name, and now there's the story there. Like, you want to know something about him. I love it. Shoot it. When this goes on, I'm a totally different person. I'm female. It's easy. We have a sequence in episode two where we're in a nightclub. Yo, we got a really good date for you. Surprise. I fixed you up. Here she is. Come here. Put your arm around Tony here. <laughs> there you go. It's a very classic Western type of barroom scene where the doors fly open and the two gunslingers walk in. We needed about 150 extras. There had to be a certain look to them. I've never looked like this before. I have been airbrushed all over. It's a place that's in the lower depths of, of Curacao, a place that we actually haven't really seen before. There is one thing worse than working with me. It's being an extra in a Star Wars movie. It's OK. <laughs> and I, I would that debate that. So when we come around that second and you have a great first assistant director um, who can move his extras around, ah, oh, it's fantastic. Everyone take a step to their right. There's two rules. First rule is I don't care what you do. I don't care where you go. I don't care if you need to buy a paper, go to the bathroom, whatever. But the second rule is you've got to tell me you're going to do it. You guys just stepped off set. What happened? Stand-ins are slightly higher in status than, than extras. Perhaps when you're standing in the queue at lunchtime, you, you can stand in front of someone who's an extra. We are indebted to you for your bravery, Obi-Wan Kenobi. In episode one, there's a scene, a particularly beautiful, haunting, dramatic scene, where there are two um, extras who I think basically define what extra acting is all about. Congratulations on your election, Chancellor. That happens to be Ben Burton myself in this sequence. Classic example for anyone that anyone can be an extra, but they can do it a lot better than we did. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, when I did Star Wars, it's the whole project was an exercise in reining myself in and designing a film to be able to get the maximum amount of strange environment and exciting spaceship action out of very, very little. I don't really have to rein myself in anymore. Welcome to episode two. Roll, please. Action! I would say over half the sets are, are digitally created. That was great. It's, it's in essence a digital movie, so that ILM is really working on every single shot. In general, George doesn't limit his thinking to what he knows can be done with the technology. He always tries to set the bar a little higher, and it's up to us to try and figure out, well, can that actually be executed? You know, film is a very collaborative medium. The ILM group is just part of the team, and uh, they're able to tell me what they can and can't do. You are the one that has to deal with the overall picture. I'm, for the visual effects, acting as the DP. So I'm concerned primarily with the technical and aesthetic issues of, uh, of putting the shots together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rob is kind of the, the actors. George will direct Rob, and Rob will pass that on to his people. We are no longer safe under their protection. Perfect. Thank okay, you. print the last one. Be sure, that, be sure that the animation department gets that piece. <laughs> and that's how we do it. No matter what you do in motion picture medium, it's, a, it's an exercise in utilizing resources and technology. You know, the sphere is always this object of mystery. People want to know what is it, what the hell are you doing? Uh, it's a way of sampling lighting in a particular location to see how the whole scene is illuminated. Whenever we're doing a digital character, we always do a block through with the voice actor and Ewan, in this case, so that they can get the timing and pacing and where their eyelines are. I don't care about these stinking eyelines. <laughs> Who cares about eyelines? Then we take the voice actor away, and uh, he has to do the scene, pantomimes the scene. The, the guy who's creating that character will create their responses off what, how you respond to their responses that aren't there. It's a nightmare. That'll do nicely. 
As we're setting up to shoot a shot, I try and project myself uh, down the line. How are we going to actually execute this shot? Flash. Uh, Jason's been measuring uh, all the camera positions, height relative to set, that if it turns out uh, later on we need to, to shoot a matching element, we can recreate that camera position. It's imperative that a match mover from ILM be on set to take set measurements and to place these track markers. Uh, without a match mover, um, these track markers might not be in a shot and it'll be, make it virtually impossible to recreate the camera move and to make a photorealistic environment. A day to shoot and probably for these shots, four or five months in post. Once we get to, back to ILM, uh, John and I would meet and he and I'll just zip through the shots and I'll say, Okay, this shot's getting really close to animation, but I'm having some problems with getting the character interact with this table. Can you help out there? So there's a lot of back and forth. Now what do I do? I go to ILM every Tuesday and Thursday morning, and I go over the work they're doing. Locked out. Even I can't get past the security. I go over on the computer, uh, the characters or the specific shots that they're working on. The, the real breakthroughs, I think, with ILM were to take the, the uh, strides and the uh, inventions that have been created over the years and then try to streamline them and make them less expensive. <laughs> you have no idea what some of these things can look like or some of these things will be. So you just kind of, you know, get out there and, and act like everything's normal. It's, uh, it's challenging because there's nothing there, but it's like theater in that way, you know. Uh, it's very demanding on the imagination. I mean, when we started doing Star Wars, it was very hard to get a spaceship to fly and pan with it. Now it's just, we don't even think about it, it's so easy. With the new digital technology and everything, I'm pretty much, whatever I can imagine, I can do. Uh, there are very, very few limits. Because it's not really George Lucas, it's digital reconstruction of him. It's all magic. I think there's a great deal in the psychological effect of a movie that comes from the soundtrack. So for me, the sound is very, very important. It's half the movie. I've always had the uh, sound designer working on the picture from the very beginning. Ben Burt created the sound for the laser sword that really affected how I approached the laser sword fight. Fantasy like Star Wars uh, requires the complete uh, fabrication of a complete sound world from footsteps to exploding space stations. Ben's sounds, they're really unique and he has just a great library of sound that he's worked with and great experience and great knowledge in that area of the artistic development of sound. Matthew Wood worked on episode one setting up the whole sound design workstation that, uh, that I was to use. He was uh, my mentor and teacher to get me started. As I, Rip Van Winkle, woke up in the future and sound had gone from the moviola analog audio to the Pro Tools and being digital. I provide him raw sound effects elements. We're revving it to the next level with the film. Let's do it with sound, too. This is the only flying example of a Vickers Vimy in the world. This was uh, the B-1 bomber of World War I. Ben has a huge amount of plane recordings, and a lot of those plane recordings have actually ended up as spacecraft in the Star Wars universe. Just wanted to get it. He knew it was something unique that didn't exist everywhere. I just have all the, the major parts of the movie in my mind and what we need to record and what elements I can provide for Ben. Pretty amazing, huh? I'll get a, a takeoff and landing, and then I also want just a couple of buys. So while I'm there, if you, you know, maybe just one or two, just like going by me, and then a circle. Could we do that? 
you know, you're going over me so I can get the Doppler effect of the, you know. Okay. Check, 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 check. It's uh, totally unique. They've got this giant wood propeller, so hopefully they're gonna oscillate in some way that's gonna sound unique. I'll try to get as many different types of sounds that it makes. That's amazing. And then all these metal struts here will be dragging in the wind. That all that can make a nice sound. If I just stay to those fence posts and walk about, you said a mile out there. About a mile, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Brakes work on this thing now. Yeah, I do. Sure. Brakes work good. Are we ready? Anything unique? Anything unique we can get for the Star Wars movie? Hey, are we in a good location? I don't want to get him like right when he's leaving the ground. thing about this airplane, it's the first airplane to fly across the Atlantic Ocean nonstop, first airplane to fly from England to Australia, and the first airplane to fly from England uh, to South Africa. It does have a really interesting sound. It's like a giant car. the best sounds are not things that you think of uh, and imagine and then go out and search for, but rather discoveries you make. Sound is happening all the time, so <laughs> you're going to get something. Um, but a lot of the stuff that you get is unexpected. Cool. The basic things that you always need to record, especially for the Star Wars movies, are like uh, you need vehicles, you need passbys. <laughs> Be the bass sound might be Obi Wan ship. No one is really going to be able to identify it as a as a plane, especially after Ben gets done tweaking it out. The end result of a motion picture is a great combination of picture and sound working together to most effectively and dramatically tell the story. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah. It really, I got a really interesting sound out of there, and we're definitely, I, it's gonna end up in the film, I bet. Cool. You know, I think someday you're going to be able to probably do about everything we can do with models. You'll be able to do them in a computer, but we're not there yet. It just takes longer at this point in time for them to build and finish a CG model than it does for them just to build one. constraints of uh, building miniatures around uh, a certain shot has just been blown wide open. We can, uh, we can do whatever we need to do to get the image and then uh, it can be uh, doctored, altered, or, or touched up uh, digitally. The major shifts in visual effects since I've been in this profession, that is, uh, that's just uh, incredible. I just turned around and suddenly we're in the computer world. The models uh, are used as a starting point and then they are, have digital enhancements on top of them. So it's not like we just do the model and put it in the picture and it's done. So we got one side which we call a hero side of the model which is where we spend all our time making things real nice. Our miniatures are built with the filmmaking process in mind. We're not just building a piece of art, we're building something that needs to be photographed. Because this will actually break into several sections for shooting, which pieces will be removable uh, so cameras can get in and such. You shoot them in various angles and things of what you need for the scenes, but you can actually pull them out and move them around and, and reconfigure them. Right. Terrific. That's great. 
it all just, you know, goes together like a jigsaw puzzle pretty quickly. We have people who have uh, very strong art backgrounds, and we have uh, electricians, we have painters. You know, we're doing a lot of miniatures as uh, environments, so George went ahead and shot all of his actors in front of blue screens, and uh, we're creating the rooms that they're actually acting in. So this is a 10-scale miniature of the interior corridor. Here's the artwork we started with. So we have a 100% miniature environment here, this hallway with Obi-Wan. That definitely sells it. Once a character goes into a model like this, it's a done deal, it's sold, and you really believe it. And which, what you're seeing is all this is uh, all, the, all the miniature stuff that we shot. And then the thing that you're missing here, because this is a shot in production, is all the digital stuff that goes in there that will change. But I don't think the shot will change. I mean, we've, we've got that bug from, uh, from George. Whenever we change a shot, it's usually finished. <laughs> It's really just a way of getting a lot of detail very fast without you know, having to spend a huge amount of time on the computer to do it. If the shot requires uh, the camera to be, say, inside a room or inside an environment, the detail and level of uh, model making needs to be exact and perfect. Sometimes it takes us a few tries to accomplish a perfect part. This one looks pretty good. You can see right here, there's a dimple in the piece that can, that can really be highlighted and, and uh, blow it. So the idea is no dust, perfect part. We have model makers that know just how to make a model look like it's correctly aged and, and built and structured correctly and weighted. You know, it looks like a building has actually got the right weight to it. There's no detail on this plane at all, but by breaking it up with paint and creating aging and drips, it's an illusion of uh, a three-dimensionality to, to this part that doesn't exist. We have a limited amount of resources, a limited amount of time, and then uh, you build whatever you need to build to accomplish a shot. In, in the computer world, all the computer guys would need to learn how to make the models, but also make them um, or be able to render them in time, especially organic shapes, but even a lot of architectural models is very time consuming. Uh, and it's faster and better still to do a lot of work with models. Boba Fett appears as a cartoon character. I think that's his first, first appearance, just after 78. The uh, holiday special. I am Boba Fett. I think a great deal of fans, 98% of fans, want to know more about him. Um, I grow up and four and five and that, and then I become a bounty hunter. Whoa, I even get the jet packs. <laughs> as we can get, as much wind as we can get. One of the great things about episode two is it really delivers on this mysterious and wonderful character, Boba Fett, and also someone who's equally uh, mysterious, uh, the character called Jango Fett. I guess he's the original bounty hunter then, because Boba Fett's like 11 years old in this one. Come back on uh, Monday, I think, to fly his spaceships. Can you do that? Fly through asteroids? Fight, shoot. Took him under my arm. Call me dad now while we're here. Okay, I'll call you son, you know, just so we get the bit of bonding going. Yeah, we just gotta use our imaginations. Actually, I think this is what fans have been waiting for ever since they saw Boba Fett in The Empire Strikes Back. Bounty hunters. And the very first day was um, a, a scene with all the bounty hunters. And I really, all I was doing was just standing and looking at Darth Vader occasionally. No disintegration. As you wish. I remember my younger son saying, um, 
Isn't it funny you put a bucket over your head, Dad, and, uh, you know, and people think you're rather cool? He's all yours, bounty hunter. It was very exciting because the first real science fiction film I'd done. Put Captain Solo in the cargo hold. Human, yes. Um, origin, unknown. Planet, unknown. He was quite a special character. It's the mystery behind this uniform. You need to see the film several times to think, why does he wear this death head? on his epaulette. Uh, they had little knee pads where I could fire darts with. They were Velcroed on, and by the end of the day, they'd obviously slipped round, so you'd have to keep shifting them. And if I walked, which I didn't do much of, they'd shoot across the room because the Velcro would snap off and fly. It wasn't easy. This is from Empire, and there's Boba Fett on set with his knee pads on upside down and his trousers rolled up. <laughs> so when we first got the photos from the fitting and we put it next to, you know, put them next to one another, you could see who it was meant to be, yeah. but also you could see it was a different character, which is quite cool. They used the Boba Fett costume for my costume as well. May the force be with you, bro. <laughs> gone for this new kind of silver millennium kind of color feels amazing and privileged to hold that mantle of the Boba Fett reign you know George what's my lines today George any dialogue you draw your guns and you pow 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 the fight scene with Obi-Wan Kenobi <laughs> the space chase through uh, asteroid planets the helmet, of course, and that got a bit, uh, bit much in the rain sometimes. Believe me, this is rain. This is real rain. Roll cameras. You know, while you're doing your action and your fight scenes, and the thing fogs up, I can't see anything. Oh well, I'll just carry on like this. <laughs> I can just see this blur coming down. Being a uh, strong, virile Māori warrior from New Zealand. Well, you just got to deal with these elements and carry on. Thank goodness for those stunt doubles. <laughs> Good MC George, the director. Ask him about your motivation. I love Boba Fett. I mean, we get to spend a lot of time with him in this movie. We get to understand where he comes from, but we also understand that, uh, we get to understand that his identity is forged in some of the most powerful events that take place in the whole Star Wars saga. But the biggest thing of all, he's, uh, he's pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> May the force be with me. It's awesome. It's even more powerful than what we see um, in uh, Empire Strikes Back. I think it's, uh, people are gonna be blown away, not only by the costume, but by the performance and the whole overall um, story that takes place between Jango Fett and Boba Fett. It wouldn't rain up in space. This is the heyday, the golden age of Jedi that's, that exists in the world we have now. In episode two. I've watched all these swashbuckling films all my life. You know, I was a huge uh, Errol Flynn fan when I was a kid. And this seems to be the next step in the fencing age. I mean, Jedi, as I've always said before, they've chosen a sword in a time of, you know, laser guns, so they better be damn good with it. All right, all right. <laughs> all Jedi don't fight exactly alike. An elegant weapon. When we started, there was a particular style developed. It's um, a combination of samurai and Western sword fighting. And when we did Phantom, we sort of progressed that style. You know, Nick Gillard uh, creates a, a unique fighting style for each of the Jedi and, and how it sort of reveals a certain element of their personality. Other Jedis have other ones, but that's, that's the one, isn't it? And it's mine. You have to distinguish between the characters, so you, you have to read the script 
a lot of times and understand the character. A lot of the aggression that I hold in my character is exemplified in my fighting style. He just, he understands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he moves really well, he's, he's tough. Anakin maybe loses control a little bit and some of the darkness emerges, uh, whereas a Jedi normally would have to be much more in control of the situation. They're like marshals in the Old West. They're the keepers of the peace. They're given um, assignments to uh, resolve conflicts. This Jedi walks by and ruins my action. With the ultimate right. threat of force if things aren't resolved. I said, don't touch it. Yo, what? Anakin, um, who's much more youthful, and I think Obi-Wan Kenobi's slightly uh, more sedate. Right. Oh, sorry. Sorry, George. <laughs> He's much more confident now. His 10 years or so have passed, I think. He's become the master, not the apprentice anymore. Obi-Wan, uh, his fighting style is much more by the book. Uh, even though he's obviously uh, very skilled. He has uh, got extraordinary balance and hand-eye coordination. But yeah, it's a long process, and not just them getting the moves, but them keeping the character. Getting the feet right and getting the steps so you can actually do it. It's a lot like dance choreography. Uh, your feet have to be right so that the strikes look correct. We're trying to go much more classical. You know, some of the characters are, are real master swordsmen, better than anything we've seen so far. Excellent. I'm trying to figure out who we had to talk to about your light color, your lightsaber color. Oh, well. Good guys are good guys are green and blue, bad guys are red. That's just the way it works. There's no purple left? You, you might get purple. It would be a shame for me to participate in a film like this and never get to use my lightsaber. We've not seen Mace fight yet, and we know that he's second only to Yoda. Good to G.O. I guess because I'm such a fan of uh, Japanese samurai movies and I've watched a lot of uh, kendo fights and a lot of stuff, I'm doing pretty good at it. I was thinking about a style for him, but it's Sam Jackson's style, you know, that he has so much style of his own. Since I'm supposedly the second baddest person in the universe, uh, I'm pretty efficient. I don't do a lot of uh, fancy sword twirling or anything. I, I dispense people pretty quickly. Use as little energy as possible, but I'm pretty lethal. Okay, cool with that? Yeah, I think this is the first time that we really get to see all the Jedi in action, uh, which is an amazing sight. But are you using the force on the end there? Yeah, yeah with him, are you making him flop around like a dead fish? No. That, say you're going like... No, 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 that's his own thing, it's gas. <laughs>
the other costumes in the first film really were about her being a queen. In episode one, she was a very formal figure and had to always be aware of her position. Last time they were so incredibly gorgeous, but it really cumbersome to wear. This one is much more about making her as beautiful as we possibly can. That's beautiful. And when Trish comes in, uh, a lot of things get thrown up because she then takes those and tries to translate those into real cloth and movement on, on the body and everything. They specifically worked hard to make them as comfortable as possible, and I really got to enjoy wearing these gorgeous, gorgeous clothes. It's very good. That's fantastic. Isn't that fun? Which one is, what is this um, for? This is packing in the apartment. Packing? <laughs> you got to just like that to pack? <laughs> Every day I'm in a different outfit. Big job. Natalie no longer plays the queen. She's now a senator. So the costumes are, are less regal and less formal and less stylized. Why don't we put a t-shirt on her? How's that? OK. My costumes are a little bit more revealing this time, no. much more feminine, not as rigid. Just to be a more casual, softer figure this time. Now this is um, P19, which Padme wears um, when she goes on a picnic uh, up to the shack fields with Hayden from the uh, retreat island. You know, she is going to fall in love. The costume in the hills in Nauru is really, really beautiful. It felt like a period piece as opposed to, you know, this futuristic piece, but it's very romantic and um, flowing. This has all been embroidered, and we've laid on the little pieces of uh, roses onto the bodice just to link the whole thing to do. This is a little shawl that gets draped over the shoulders. And then there's twists of colored ribbons in, in matching colors. Light, summery, but quite sort of fun. So she can run about the fields and the dress floats. <laughs> and then sort of with the hair, I think we made it very Star Wars-y. That was great. We have a much more romantic story, so that Padme's costumes are obviously more sultry in nature and, you know, revealing and pretty. There's one costume that George designed himself. <laughs> and that was sort of the costume that, you know, I came on set and everyone was like, oh. <laughs> that was an interesting costume to wear. And it was really hard at the end of the day because the corset was so tight. They made my waist like you know, 20 inches or something. It's him. <laughs> Magical. It's the great way that George sort of portrays women. They can be powerful and they can be soft and they can wear beautiful clothes and, and that doesn't contradict her strength. I think that's great with this character. It's sitting for tight. She's this like tough, smart woman that everyone's trying to kill because she's such a powerful leader and she also wears the coolest clothes. <laughs>
with two different cameras so we can actually take the part of that fight that we like and then we can actually composite them all together in one big fight where there'll be a hundred of them all together in one shot. A lot of it is that more than any other kind of movie, this depends on trust. And if you don't quite know what's happening, you get, especially actors, get very nervous. Mm -hmm. you know, especially when there's nothing to hang on to. And I don't even know everything that's going to be there until I actually start working on it. It really is like a giant sketchbook, giving more of a, like a poetic, just general swath of the, you know what is the feeling, the mood, the lighting, color, palette of the location. The, the whole world of Geonosis is a combination of a kind of organic designed environment with a kind of tinge of industrial design in it. Through the notes and direction and, and George sort of trust in us exploring things, literally in the doodle sketchbook phase, we can quickly leap from a, a verbal concept to these color abstracts. George really was into the um, these termite-inspired towers, as if uh, you know they're great architects in the natural world. So, by bringing in these tower elements, um, carving into the rocks, it shows a, an ancient society, a very insect-like and very primal. Poggle, something a little bit tougher than the average uh, Geonosian. George presented them as a species that could just sort of disappear into the rock. These ideas provide an inspiration and a conversation point for our meetings with George. Once we've had those conversations about the Clone War, we're basically everything in the movie's covered. Yeah. And we're in it, in everything. There's nothing sort of sitting on the shore anymore. It was a giant arena where there was an execution, so it was very much you know, like a Roman Coliseum in that guise of a spectator sport. We built this huge stadium. During the ground battle, we'll use this. It'll be photographed and then replicated over and over again to help create the Geonosian landscape. I think the camera move is gonna start somewhere in here and use this corner as if the gunships have come out. They're coming around here, they're heading that way, and they're kind of flying past this piece so the camera will come across this way. Fabulous. Fantastic. It's exotic, something we haven't done before. So here we go. Here we, we go. 300 something shots. <laughs> A whole reel. Yeah. The ability to be able to take anything that you can imagine and turn it into a completely photorealistic event where you can comp in any actor and it's seamless is really the dream that all of us have. It's, it's his point of view, so the camera okay. would be right there. You see this edge. Pretty tight then, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's kind of sort of a waist shot. Yeah, okay. Shoot that, then we have a geography of what it is we're looking at in terms of backgrounds and whatnot. It's a giant exercise in having a vivid imagination. And the effect of a thousand screaming termites. Yeah. yeah. That helps. We've got match moves that have come from the plates that they shot on live action. I can now key out the blue, and then see what our characters look like when I'm first lining up the shot. So that as we pan or tilt or slide across the background, it's gonna match exactly what the characters are doing. Now we got a lot of close-up shots, and so we found that it would be faster if we just split the entire arena in half, and then have one crew doing the opposite direction of the other crew. And that way we can get more stuff into post faster and get those shots coming out. I think is probably the largest action sequence we have ever tried to even contemplate, uh, much less achieve. Uh, um, we're very, very excited about it. It is so big. Whether there'll be anything quite on this level in terms of a real six in the next film, but you know, it'll be more like uh, Empire, where it's you know, mostly just personal rather than grandiose. That's what you said last time. 
Well, I said, well, I said this is a love story, and it's not a... Yeah, so there's going to be a lot of original <laughs> effects this time, because it's, it's a love story. I lied, didn't I?